Hi everyone, I'm Paige Smith with Below the Radar, a knowledge democracy podcast. Below the Radar is created by SFU's Fancy Office of Community Engagement and is recorded on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. To mark the 100th episode of Below the Radar, we check in with Simon Fraser University's recently installed President and Vice Chancellor Joy Johnson. She chats with our host, Am Johal, about her vision for SFU and how the university is meeting the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi there, welcome to uh, Below the Radar. We're very excited to be on episode uh, 100. We never expected uh, to be here and we are uh, luckily joined by uh, the newish president of SFU, Joy Johnson, who was uh, installed at the very beginning of September. Thank you so much for joining us, Joy. Thank you very much, Am. It's great to be here and congratulations on your 100th episode. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, Joy, so what a strange time to be uh, coming in as uh, a president uh, as president um, uh, during uh, a global uh, pandemic. But if there's anyone uh, sort of prepared for that in any way, uh, I suppose it's you because you actually come from a health uh, background uh, your, yourself. I'm wondering if you can talk sort of um, a little bit about sort of, uh, I guess the, the challenge of post-secondary um, uh, education in terms of your conversations with other university presidents and, and the particular um, challenges to post-secondary in, in this time uh, and at SFU. Yeah, so it is a challenging time. There's no doubt about it. You know, last March, we at Simon Fraser University pivoted to move our teaching online. And so I guess that would be challenge number one, right, is um, finding new pedagogies, new ways to provide um, learning experiences for our students that are meaningful and meet the objectives, uh, uh, learning objectives. And, you know, I have to say at SFU, and I would say, um, you know, talking to presidents across this country, uh, it really has been quite remarkable uh, to see how quickly we were able to do that, to move courses online, but also how effective it's been. Um, our enrollments have remained very strong at, S at Simon Fraser University, but also we see fairly strong enrollments in Canada, at least uh, across the board. There certainly are some areas that are really challenging to teach. Uh, and those are more, you know, areas like chemistry. But I was talking to people in the, uh, you know, in our dance program, you know, it's very hard to teach dance online. Um, <laughs> And so we are this January moving more some more classes uh, on campus for some face to face, but always keeping um, the safety of our faculty, staff, and students at the foreground. I, I'd say another challenge uh, is mental health, um, and that's the mental health uh, of our faculty, staff, and students. I think most importantly, our students. You know, just imagine being a brand new student uh, coming to university the first time and. This is your experience sitting at your parents' kitchen table, basically, you know, taking courses. Uh, and, you know, so it's, it's stressful, it's difficult. And we're seeing that play out in a variety of ways. And I would say, um, you know, one of the concerns I had, particularly as I started my presidency in September, people are tired. Um, they're tired uh, because it's so intense doing this work um, virtually but they're just tired because they aren't having a lot of fun right now. <laughs> it's uh, they're missing their friends. They're not able to do, you know, have the outlets that they're used to having. So I am concerned. I think that's another big, big challenge um, is our, is the mental health. And then maybe just, I'll mention a third. There's so many, but let me mention a third. And the third really relates to equity. Um, you know, we know the pandemic has shone a light on um, inequities in our society but I think that gets carried into our institutions as, as well. And we really are, I think, needing um, to, to pay attention to the challenge of inclusion in a new way. And certainly social movements like Black Lives Matter have pushed us to also really think uh, about the ways in which our institutions um, have racism embedded in them and what we need to do in that area, in that area, you know, in that area. And, and that's not COVID specific, but COVID adds a challenge to that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, uh, Joy, I had a chance to um, catch uh, the installation ceremony um, online. It was a really emotional, exciting uh, event. I'm wondering if you can just talk ab about that a little bit, what was going through your mind as, as you were uh, installed. SFU hasn't had that many presidents, a fairly new university from 1965. Uh, yeah, so I feel really, you know, in some ways, um, because of the pandemic, we couldn't do the big, you know, thousands of people in Convocation Mall kind of installation. But I feel like it was very special. So for a few reasons. Number one, we did indigenize um, the ceremony in a way that hadn't been indigenized. So I have new ceremonial, um, you know, robes um, that were designed um, with our local First Nations symbols on them. And that was very meaningful. We um, at Simon Fraser University give a nod to our Scottish heritage with pipes, but added drumming, uh, indigenous drumming, and that was incredible. Um, but I would say for me, um, um, because of the pandemic, I was uh, uh, my I couldn't be robed by you know in the normal way. I think usually it would be the chancellor or someone else would give me my robe to put on. But they needed people in my bubble um, to do that. And so I had my 84 year old mother uh, do that as well as my wife, Pam. And to have both of them on the stage with me in that very intimate, like getting kind of dressed by, your, by the people who are really close to you, that was really meaningful. And then I think the third thing, uh, another thing that really stood out for me for that day was Chris Lewis, our chancellor, who is a counselor with the Squamish Nation um, you know, in his remarks, he didn't just thank, um, he didn't just thank me, but he thanked, he thanked my family for letting me do this work. And I thought that was very moving for me as well. I thought it was, it was quite, quite special um, to have that kind of recognition. And the other thing that Chris said that I, I say to people on occasion, he said, you might think that you work for joy as the president of SFU but I want to assure you that Joy Johnson works for you. And that's a good reminder about the role of the president that I work for this university. And um, it's something uh, you know, that I continue to hold on to. It, it is important. Now, Joy, prior to becoming a president, you, you were, of course, vice president researcher at SFU. You had a long career at um, uh, UBC, but, but uh, prior to that, you worked in healthcare. I if I remember correctly, you were a public health nurse in Vanderhoof, uh, I think, or am I close? <laughs> and, yeah, you're, you're uh, in the vicinity. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually, my, one of my very first jobs, Sam, was as a nurse working uh, in Burns Lake, British Columbia. Burns Lake. Okay. And uh, Burns Lake, uh, it was a small hospital um, uh, that I worked in. And you basically did everything from delivering babies to, you know, working in emergency because it's, it's so, it was so small. Um, and just to be the, you know, to be a part of this kind of community embedded hospital um, was really quite, quite the experience, especially for a brand new nurse, I have to say. Yeah, and and for people who aren't familiar with your own uh, research background, uh, what were the kinds of things that you were doing uh, in terms of your your research work when you when you uh, were doing graduate uh, and and uh, graduate school and and also as a, as a professor? Yeah, so my my biggest interests really were um, was related to what gets referred to as the social determinants of health. Um, and in particular, how certain social dynamics and, I, and, and the three frames I used a lot in my work were how gender, um, other forms of diversity and place where one lives shapes one's health behavior, health outcomes. And um, uh, so I was really interested in um, the fact that, you know, uh, that, that our policies and practices didn't pay attention enough to um, these dynamics. We weren't tailoring um, our interventions to the degree they needed to be. And that one's possibilities for a healthful life um, really were being shaped not by your physician and whether you took your prescription, but by these other forces. And I really think that's important um, to continue to be thinking about. And we see this playing out in the pandemic as well in terms of who in particular is most vulnerable um, so, you know, that really, uh, in particular, um, set me up to take on um, a role later on after I worked as a professor and, and, and did this research. A lot of my work was 
related to drug use as well, uh, beginning with tobacco use, because it's so interesting, for example, how gendered tobacco use is, and then marijuana use with teenagers, highly gendered again, in terms of the way girls and boys use marijuana. Um, and then also place-based, where you are, all of those factors shaping these kinds of practices. Um, and I did a project actually in the downtown east side on crack cocaine use in very early days, looking at safer crack use, the first uh, project in the downtown east side in that area where we involved, we only focused on women because they were last on the pipe and also so incredibly vulnerable. Um, so we wanted to do a kind of a women's, women focused intervention. But all of that work um, really set me up um, to be thinking more broadly about in particular gender. And I had the opportunity um, to apply and was successful in becoming the scientific director for the Institute of Gender and Health then um, at the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, where I really continued to push in terms of helping us think particularly about gender and health outcomes. You know, um, uh, even prior to the pandemic uh, happening, we were, you know, experiencing, uh, you know, a lot of social polarization. The the election of of Donald Trump certainly um, amped that up. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of questions being asked of the university right now. But these kind of worries about the uh, social polarization, social inequality, and, and what the role of the university may be. I'm wondering how you um, think about these questions now as a university president. You're certainly uh, aware of them uh, as a as a researcher, uh, given the, the the areas that you that you work in. But as as a president, when you think about the university as an institution, and here we have much more public universities than the states, where there is a a, a big culture of, of private universities. But um, as a kind of public servant, you know, what is the, the role of these places today, given the kinds of challenges around polarization that are out there and how they relate to, to democracy and democratic practices? Yeah, it's a big, it is a big question. And, you know, uh, it is one I'm thinking more and more about. So to begin with, you know, let's face it, universities are elitist. Um, and I think, um, and, 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 and often because of no fault of their own, young people find themselves in circumstances where they don't even think they have an opportunity to go to university. And so who gets to go to university? Uh, people who really have been set up uh, in particular ways to be encouraged to have these opportunities to have the, and, and who have the assets to do so. So I think first and foremost, as we think about this polarization, we as a public institution need to think about how we can um, provide opportunities, pathways for particularly young people who might not be able to see themselves coming into the, a, a place like a university. Um, and so, and that's something, you know, I don't, uh, recently, for example, I'm so thrilled to see, uh, we had a major gift to the university to help support equity deserving groups uh, to come into the university and get a full ride scholarship. So that's tuition, books, you know, rent, all of that. And that's what we need to find more ways to kind of you know, level the playing field. But the other thing around this whole thing is um, we have to recognize that um, I, I do think we have a role to play in terms of trying to host and hold um, the difficult discussions about um, um, this polarization in our society and, uh, and be willing to really confront, um, I guess, you know, the, you know, we need to hold a mirror up to ourselves, I guess, and to think about our own institutions and how our own practices and policies might exclude people. But we also have to be able to host and hold conversations about uh, about inclusion and and be prepared to be prepared to listen, but also be prepared to change. And that's that's hard. I, I see that across the university. I think that is very very hard. Uh, and the best. Part of this work is done in partnership, and it's done in partnership with um, with communities um, who want to work on issues together. Um, you know, we've got a project right now at SFU um, that Janet Weber is engaged in on anti-racism and um, with community members. And I think that kind of partnered work where we bring some expertise resources to the table, but we learn so much. So that kind of partnered work, um, I think is something that we need to, to do more of. And as an institution, we need to realize, um, you know, that as much as we have hol are holders of a lot of knowledge, 
uh, there is so much more that we need to learn and so much more we can benefit from, from engaging uh, in these discussions. Um, you know, the other thing, uh, and uh, maybe won't go down this road too much, but we'll see where we go, uh, Am, um, is, and this is something I've thought about a lot, is, uh, is this idea of freedom of speech, academic freedom in the place of a university. And, um, you know, are there limits to that? And how do you, how do you hold that tension around trying to have hard conversations, but also being very, very respectful um, um, about people's, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, about where they're sitting in their lives, but also making sure that we don't cross the line in terms of, you know, um, offenses related to human rights. So these are, again, really difficult conversations, I think, for us to be having, but we need to be thinking about them. Yeah. Um, during the uh, provincial um, election last year, there was a, a, a kind of a, an, an announcement that almost came out of nowhere, but not not really. But it was it was a bit sudden uh, of a new medical school uh, out in, in in Surrey, and I'm wondering um, uh, how you're thinking that project through. Um, I imagine this is a multi-year project setting up a, a medical school. It's a very complex. Um, uh, a thing to do, and uh, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what your your understanding of that is now. Yeah, so uh, for the past 10 years or so, Simon Fraser University off and on had had conversations about developing a medical program and, you know, really had not been able to convince, you know, our programs get funded and approved by our provincial governments and, you know, really had not been able to make the case um, so uh, many of us were quite surprised when the um, new Democratic Party platform included a promise to establish a new medical program um, uh, in British Columbia, in our province, uh, and at Simon Fraser University. And I, I just want to, I want to begin by saying this is an amazing opportunity. There, you know, I, I, I really want to emphasize how infrequently we establish new medical programs, you know, um, you know, it's kind of like not even once in a decade, you have an opportunity in Canada, like they, they're just not, it's just not done because it's expensive. And because there's quite a bit of saturation in this programming. So we are, we we're going to take this really seriously because there's an opportunity to be innovative, to push the envelope in medical education, which I think is incredible. We are, the program we're talking about is a different kind of program. Um, and that's been what we've talked about from the very beginning, that it is a generalist medical education program. And so what's interesting to me is to think about, and this was an example that was given to me. Um, so just bear with me. When you think about a, a family physician, a generalist, a primary care provider, they might see, I don't know, let's just say on average of the 350 patients they might see, two might end up or three might end up in the hospital. But where do we train our physicians right now? For the most part, we train them in the hospital. And it just doesn't make any sense when you think about it. Like uh, for generalists, they need to be able to work in community, in teams with others. So I think we, and we, I've had some great conversations with uh, Roger Strasser, the previous and first dean of the Northern Ontario School of Medicine about their program, which really was a generalist program. So that's exciting to me um, to think about a new, a new type of program that could actually kind of flip and really be community focused. The other thing that's um, really exciting is to think about um, working with our partners and there's a, what's referred to as a health authority. Um, so that's the Fraser Health Authority that really is responsible for delivery of health care. But in British Columbia, we also have a First Nations Health Authority, mm -hmm. which is providing health care to our Indigenous First Nations. And, we, and this program will be in partnership with those two health authorities. So to think about how one might actually indigenize a medical program, not just kind of a, an additional course or whatever, but what would that mean? But the other piece that I'm particularly excited about and that fits so well with SFU is to think about at the very beginning to go out and engage the community and to ask, what do you need in your medical professionals now and help the community shape expectations and values um, for our medical program. 
Now, that being said, you know, don't get me wrong. It's not as if we can just do anything. There are accreditation and certain things that, you know, expectations that we need to meet. But I, I think there is an opportunity to push the envelope here and to think differently and to think about recruiting students who really want um, to work in community. Um, and that excites me. So um, early days, uh, stay tuned. Um, we are just having our first meeting with our partners next week. And we'll, we're going to have to really hit the ground running um, in the next few months uh, to move this work forward. And it will take, uh, uh, you know, the next three years at least to, to get a program established. Mm -hmm. Really exciting, really interesting work. Um, uh, SFU's uh, campuses are also um, uh, in uh, Burnaby and Vancouver. And Burnaby, one of the, the pieces that's been talked about for some time is the potential for a gondola. And uh, it relates, I guess, in some ways to the student experience as well. But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about SFU and its relationship to uh, Burnaby and the, the possibilities there as you see uh, how the university can, can connect. Yeah, so um, uh, so it's interesting. I just for the listeners who don't know about um, our Burnaby Mountain campus, it is on top of a, literally on top of a mountain. You know, back in the day, people built universities thinking they should be away from the cities, right? Like cloistered, uh, you know, institutions. Um, and you know, uh, I think we've all realized there's way more to be gained by um, finding ways to embed our institutions in our cities and work in partnership. And, you know, in part at, on Burnaby Mountain, we've built a city around the university that we built the city to, you know, um, so we can have, um, you know, connectivity with our, with our neighbors. But um, we still recognize there are challenges being located, our campus being located up on Burnaby Mountain. Um, in, in Vancouver, when it snows, it's like the whole place stops um, and the buses that serve our university can't make it up the mountain. So we're, we've got a lot of challenges um, there, but also um, there are challenges because, um, you know, again, don't want to go down this road too far, but we have a pipeline being built very near our campus and, uh, um, and there's only one road of exit for the campus. So we're very interested in building a gondola. Um, this is a people mover gondola. I want you to imagine, uh, and we've seen this in other cities around the world where we've seen very effective people movers. And this would be a game changer uh, for our students. Um, our students need to move across the three campuses sometimes. Um, we do have some SkyTrain or rapid transit between, um, you know, across the district and this would link up and be able to help people move much more effectively. And it's green, um, it's green technology as well, um, which is really exciting. So we are working right now with the city of Burnaby and others uh, to make the case. Uh, we need to try and find funding from the provincial government as well as the federal government um, to make this happen. But it's fairly cheap as well. It would actually pay for itself in about five years or so um, because it would release buses, um, uh, it's green technology. And um, so it's, it's great technology. So I think that's an example of a project where you need to work with your municipality and um, it, would, it would just provide a great bridge. But there are other areas, you know, our cities um, really do value um, the role of the university. Uh, uh, we are big employers. Uh, our students, you know, use uh, shop and use the restaurants and the, you know, the amenities in our cities. But we also have, um, you know, a brain trust. We have uh, amazing researchers and students uh, and staff who want to work to solve pressing issues together. And we've seen some great examples of, um, of our research community um, working um, with municipalities, Burnaby, Vancouver, Surrey, on, on issues um, to help them, you know, sort through anything from you know, homelessness issues to issues of addiction to issues of transportation. So um, I think that th these links, I think, will become more and more important for universities, particularly public universities. Yeah, and, and certainly in uh, Vancouver, where SFU's had a, a long time downtown uh, presence, I think we're probably up to nine or 10 buildings or something like that. How you view uh, SFU's relationship to the, the, the city of Vancouver? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I wasn't at SFU when the downtown presence was established, but I'm very cognizant of the fact that there was a lot of concern about, you know, the gentrification of the downtown east side in particular, 
about how this would affect the community. And there was a real commu commitment from the beginning, and you know this, Anne, to find ways to um, make sure our institution could continue to serve the community. And I've seen that play out in a, in a really, I think, positive way. Uh, and I, um, you know, we, I'm really pleased that we have uh, a large downtown presence in Vancouver. Uh, and in part because, you know, some of our biggest challenges right now um, socially are challenges that really are embedded in our cities. And as you know, you know, these are issues related to homelessness, you know, addiction, um, issues, you know, related to, you know, work-life balance, issues related to um, transportation. All of these things are, are of deep concern to cities, but also to our research community and to the university. And there are so many ways that we can work together and there again, there's been some great examples of, of incredible partnerships. Uh, and that's, I think, um, in my, certainly in my research career, but as vice president research as well um, at SFU, I think that that's the most meaningful work that we can do, right? Is to do great research, but to realize that it, it can make a difference and that it is being, being used to solve, um, you know, pressing, pressing social issues. So uh, I think the more we can be kind of hand in glove with our cities, as I said, the better. Now, now Joy, um, as you know, uh, uh, better than most, a uh, university is a big, complicated um, institution. There's so many demands uh, made on a, a president. Uh, and and you, you've, you've set out uh, a few big uh, ideas that you'd like to see movement on. You've talked about um, student experience as one area. Oftentimes SFU does very well in its categories and in, in rankings. And that's one area that that uh, could use some uh, Im improvement on. Um, you've also mentioned equity, diversity, inclusion, and, and also um, uh, to move further on uh, indigenization of the campus. So, so first of all, around the student experience piece, as you've gone out and spoken to stakeholders, including uh, students, uh, what are your some, some of your thoughts on how um, SFU could do a better job in the future related to that part of, very, very important part of, of going to university? Yeah. So I think, first of all, you know, I, we all recognize that, um, you know, while great learning happens inside the classroom, some of the most uh, important learning takes place outside of the classroom. And so to have a vibrant university community, but also great work integrated learning opportunities for our students, it's, I think, something we need to think about. And um, I do think, you know, the, the, you know, post pandemic, just thinking about the broader university campuses and what we have to offer our students in terms of uh, extracurricular activities and other, other supports is really important. You know, SFU for the most part has been a commuter campus, um, but we also are building more and more residents on our Burnaby campus right now. So we'll have more and more students living on our university. And I think that will change university life, uh, particularly on Burnaby Mountain. Um, so I, I do think uh, uh, continuing to think about these other kind of vibrant, um, meaningful educational experiences so that students, so often the other thing that happens, Ammon, is that, you know, the co-op experience, the work integrated learning experience happens very much later in your university tenure and your undergraduate degree. But how can we get, you know, really great experiences early on so that students feel, you know, this is, you know, you come you come to university because you want to, I don't know, um, study, you know, biology, but you just end up with these, you know, you have to take your math and you, you're not in into the real interesting content of biology, not until really third or fourth year sometimes. So I think to think about our programming, to think about the way we support our students and to think about these additional um, areas um, are, are primary. But the other thing is to continue around the student experience to find ways to support our students. Uh, we're seeing more and more in particular around mental health stress, et cetera, that we need to do more to wrap around services um, so that they feel well supported. So those are a few um, areas I think that we can work on. And don't get me wrong, I think actually the gondola will be a huge game changer for our students. It'll create a vibrancy on our campus, um, Burnaby Mountain for sure. 
uh, I think will become a destination in a different way. And um, yeah, so I'm, I, I really think that that really will be incredible. But I also, part of the reason I, I, I really have put a pin in student experience as a priority is I think as a university, we really need to remember that we are about our students and um, they really need to be at the heart of our considerations and um, really be foremost in our mind. Yes, we do great research. Yes, we do great community engagement, but we are an educational institution and we need to make sure we're paying attention every day um, to the lives of our students. So that's part of the reason I've also really um, um, said that that needs to be a priority for all of us. And uh, around uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, I think it's so important that you've really uh, put this on the, the table in a really high profile way. I, I think uh, uh, universities are very uh, diverse in terms of um, uh, staff and students and all those things. But I guess the higher you go up the hierarchy, uh, the less diverse it is to some degree. As, as a person of color working at the university, I, 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 I do notice when I'm in meetings with um, all white people besides me. And uh, I can remember working at UBC in the, in the 90s as well when uh, the word at that time was, was diversity. And I remember the, the more sort of conservative parts of the university people kind of rolling their eyes at that diversity stuff and seeing you know, multiple decades uh, go by. And uh, around equity, diversity, inclusion, um, um, how do you see um, it um, landing down at the university or how to uh, bring it forward in a way that can uh, move the dial. And I guess, you know, one of the challenges that probably come up as well is that there are democratic practices like hiring at a departmental level or union contracts and those types yeah. of things that are part of this structure of the, the university. I'm not saying that they're necessarily impediments, but there are uh, structures and processes that take some time to unfold as, as well. And how you think about um, that uh, from a, a senior level at the, at the university. Yeah, I'm glad you, you know, I, I totally agree with you that, um, you know, uh, as you go up and you see this across Canada, um, that we do not have, you know, a diverse leadership in universities. Um, and and that, that, that's something that, that does concern me. It's interesting. I mean, uh, you know, as, a, you know, a white settler, um, you know, albeit a gay white settler, um, um, I am also very, I really recognize my privilege in all of this, um, but I also realize I'm the only woman who's the president of a research intensive university in Western Canada right now. So um, there's still, if you look at the faces of university presidents across this country, you still see a lot of men in particular white men. So yeah, we have work to do. And um, you know, you know, and my observation is that we are self-replicating in our hiring practices, and we think that we, you know, we will just replace ourselves, right? That you know, and that we have learned that that is bias, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> ifs, ands, or buts, um, and that you know, that and and that language of fit is absolutely no longer appropriate for us. That we do need to hire. To bring in different perspectives and um, and be pushing ourselves, and not always hire based 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 on experience, but being being able to hire based on promise, because there are so many people, particularly people of color, black individuals, indigenous people, who haven't been given the opportunity. If you're never given the opportunity, how are you going to get the experience? For heaven's sakes. So um, I am heartened, though, uh, on maybe two grounds. Number one. In my first four months, I've been going across this university and talking about my priorities. And um, uh, when I talk about equity, diversity, and inclusion, everyone's getting it now. Um, I haven't had anyone, they might be saying this behind my back, you know, but I haven't had anyone really challenge me and say, why are you focusing on that? And certainly at the senior leadership team on my executive with the deans and others, everyone knows this is the time. Um, we must act, we must figure out how we can move ourselves forward. And there are little signs of um, institutional opportunity to move forward. In the last collective agreement with the Faculty Association, this is the collective agreement that governs the processes, the pay, the et cetera. Um, the Faculty Association bargained that all hiring committees would get unconscious bias training. 
So, you know, that's fantastic. Um, you know, we can criticize unconscious bias training until the cows come home kind of thing, but that's an important step. It's one step. There's more to be done. And training doesn't necessarily mean you'll have the outcomes. But I'm also seeing across the university people hiring, um, you know, um, experts in EDI, um, embedding this work in their faculties. It's going to be culture change for us. And we, um, so I, I think I have a role to play. I think tone on top is important uh, to talk about the issue, to shine a light on it, to talk about expectations. But it is about all of us leaning in and not asking our um, equity deserving colleagues to carry that load anymore because they've been carrying it long enough. Uh, and the burden of that load, I see that every day, that it shouldn't be up to the woman in the room, the person of color in the room, the indigenous person to say not anymore, you know, like we, all of us have to figure out how we can together change the dial here. And I see some signs of that changing at SFU, but don't get me wrong, we got a ways to go. And um, that's something I'm excited about. I do think we can do this work, um, but I keep saying this will not be quick and this will not be easy. Um, and I've hit some roadblocks and I've, and I'm, I've made mistakes already as well. Like that's the thing, you gotta be prepared to own your own mistakes in this process and, um, and be real about it, right? Like just, just own it and move forward. Now, uh, uh, the TRC calls to action made some very specific uh, demands around higher education and uh, indigenization and decolonization processes at the, the, the university. There's a lot of people that are uh, working um, on this. Some institutions uh, have done some uh, uh, um, uh, block hiring and um, other kinds of uh, ways to kind of really uh, push some of these things forward. Um, and I'm wondering how um, you're thinking about this with uh, different colleagues at um, SFU to make SFU a more welcoming place for Indigenous people and researcher and researchers and, and students as well. Yeah, um, so we had um, in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, SFU a number of years ago put together a and a reconciliation, Aboriginal Reconciliation Council, and they came up with 34 recommendations for our university, calls to action for our university. And we made some progress, but I, I will say there's more work to be done. Um, one of the things that concerns me at SFU is I think we're quite fragmented in our, in our efforts, um, you know, and, and I'm, I've been talking a little bit about what structures can we put in place to help move this work forward to make sure that we are successful, that we are tracking, that people are just kind of benefiting from supporting one another. Um, Chris Lewis, who I mentioned earlier, who is the chair of our board and um, a counselor with the, with the a Squamish Nation, uh, hosted a conversation um, with me with our Indigenous faculty, staff and students uh, in December, about three or four weeks ago. And, um, you know, it was very clear in that discussion that they just don't have enough opportunity to come together as a community and they need to find ways to be, be able to be supported um, and that they really value that. Um, and because we are, as you said, you know, we've got 37,000 students and, you know, thousands of faculty, you know, we're a big organization and we've got very few of them and we need to, A, find ways for them to connect. So that's kind of structurally, how do we do that? But then to continue to build their numbers um, and we do have some great hiring underway right now, and some of it is cluster based, but there's more we need to do. I have to say, our, it, you know, if, there's great demand for Indigenous faculty right now. And so we got to also, you know, feed the pipeline, get more students to university and into graduate school as well, um, so that we can um, make sure that they um, can, can move into the professoriate. I'm, and, and to that end, it's interesting, um, as part of my early conversations, I've been um, really privileged to sit down, for example, with some of the chiefs from our First Nations. Um, uh, for example, the chief of the Suela Tooth Nation talked to me very seriously about the need for young people in that community just to have an opportunity to be on campus to feel what, to find out what it's like to be on the university, what's the university about. So we're beginning to have some conversations about ways we can support that. And one of our 
uh, Indigenous faculty members in uh, Michelle Pigeon um, recently completed with colleagues a report on pathways for Indigenous students with great recommendations on the ways that we need to bring them to campus early, reach out to communities, support them when they're with us. Um, so I, uh, it really is a great blueprint and I'm really looking forward. We've got a new provost on board, Catherine Deverne, who's going to take up and work with that report and figure out how we can move that work forward. So no shortage of work to be done there, uh, absolutely. Um, but I, I, I do think um, there is a bit of a blueprint there and we just need to kind of keep moving it forward. Uh, uh, Joy, what are you most excited about now that you've been uh, been um, on for four or five months uh, here? That's a lot of work you have on your plate. Um, what are you most excited about in the, the near future here? Well, you know, um, I think what I'm most excited about is the vaccination. <laughs> I have to say, I mean, um, I think we're all just holding on right now. And uh, I am looking forward to the day where it will be safe for our faculty, staff and students to be back on campus where I can be with my family, you know, and travel and have all of that. You know, that's I think that's that's the, the thing I'm holding on to. And as a university president, you know, I think that, you know, you do want to be in touch with your community and it's hard to do this virtually, right? Like it's hard to get a sense, uh, you know, of, of where people are at. Um, you just, you can't lay eyes on them. You can lie, lay eyes on them virtually and that's great. We've figured out some great ways to do that, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to the day that I can walk across our campuses and just have casual conversations with people and not have to set it up on Zoom. And, you know, just, um, yeah, uh, I think that's, that will make a huge difference for me. Um, and I'm missing, you know, part of being a president is also hosting great events. Um, and we're doing some of that virtually, but it's not the same. Um, I think we all know that it's just not the same. So looking forward to that. Yeah, Joy, I'm uh, so um, uh, happy to be associated with the institution, with you as uh, president, and feel like things are in, in very good hands. And thank you so much for joining us on Below the Radar for episode 100. Yeah, it's been my pleasure, uh, Am. Thank you for your work. Uh, I just um, really have enjoyed uh, working with you over the years. So looking forward to seeing and hearing about episode 200. <laughs> <laughs> Below the Radar is a knowledge democracy podcast created by SFU's Vancity Office of Community Engagement. Thanks for listening to our conversation with SFU President Joy Johnson. You can learn more about her and the SFU initiative she describes in the episode in our show notes. Thanks again for listening and staying with us till our 100th episode. We'll see you next time on Below the Radar.